So good evening. This is the uh, uh, this is our first uh, go at the new digs. We're doing these classes over YouTube, as opposed to the older um, to the older form. And uh, I'm sure it'll take some getting used to, but uh, uh, working together, I'm sure we can get the bugs out. The um, only the only uh, difference is that uh, you have to have a YouTube account to be able to um, you have to have a YouTube account to be able to participate in the chat. So that's um, you can see the chat window is open, and uh, if you have a question, just uh, type it in, and uh, just like it was in the old um, in the old situation, I will uh, then get to. Uh, get to your comments. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the uh, uh, Semitic languages. And I want to, uh, oh, one, I think it's just interesting from the point of view of, uh, of knowing cool stuff to know a bit about these languages. But uh, they do bear on our, our study as, of the Bible and also in our understanding as our ongoing understanding and what it means to be Jewish. The um, the other thing is, this is a very uh, sort of a personal topic for me. It was really when I uh, started to study Akkadian uh, at Penn that I, um, I decided that uh, religious studies could also be very serious. And that, uh, you know, I, my background was in the sciences. And uh, at that time, I had studied some Hebrew and I'd studied some Aramaic. But it was really, uh, it was really Akkadian that uh, sealed the deal for me in terms of um, uh, deciding to make a life of uh, studying Jewish matters. So I will, um, I'll, I'll dedicate this class to uh, my, uh, my old Akkadian teacher, uh, Dr. Barry Eichler. Uh, a, a great, great man, and I'll apologize in advance for everything that I that I get wrong. Uh, he he did his best. He did his best. So to start, look at this map here. Uh, this is a map of all of the uh, world language families that we have today. I mean, of course, if we look at this, we see that it would be a much different map if we were um, if we were looking before 1492. Uh, that the uh, particularly the uh, uh, the uh, languages in um, the language families of North and South America were not indigenously uh, Indo-European. Uh, that's a consequence of colonization and uh, the spread of languages. But we know that languages evolve and languages die, and uh, they displace each other. The middle family, the middle yellow family, which we see which covers the entire Arabian Peninsula and uh, most of uh, the uh, north part of Africa, uh, that's called the Afro-Asiatic family. And the the reason that uh, it's highlighted, uh, is that it has so much uh, representation, uh, historically the, uh, the Afro-Asiatic family uh, contains the Semitic languages, it contains the Ethiopic languages, it contains Chadic, etc. But the reason that it has such a prominent place there is because of Arabic today, of course, is a Semitic language and therefore part of the Afro-Asiatic family. And uh, we will, uh, and we'll see that uh, uh, we, we might think of Hebrew as being the most important Semitic language. Um, that, uh, but really, in the terms of uh, world history, uh, we are a bit player. From the view of history, there are three ages of uh, Semitic languages that matter, and none of them involve Hebrew. The first is uh, the first is what we're going to study tonight, uh, the age of Akkadian. Uh, the second is the age of Aramaic, which we'll do next week. And the third is the age of Arabic. And uh, we see that Arabic, uh, of all of these, has a lasting uh, legacy as a world power, as a language of empire. The Semitic languages themselves, I mean, just as the world has its own set of world language family, the Semitic languages themselves can be broken up into groups. And we usually break them up into these four groups. Uh, we have the uh, southern group, which um, some people call it the southeast group, 
which consists of Ethiopic, South Arabic, South Arabic, and uh, Amharic. Uh, we're not going to be dealing with those because I don't have any. Uh, I, I don't have any uh, idea about them. I've never studied them, but they're there. So uh, we'll mention them in, as part of the taxonomy. Uh, Arabic is really sort of a family unto itself. Uh, we have then the Northwest group, which consists of Canaanite, which includes Hebrew, but uh, we also have Moabite and uh, Phoenician, well, which was, of course, very influ influential because the Phoenicians were great traders. So Phoenician is spread all around the Mediterranean coast. But we're not going to do that tonight. Tonight is about Akkadian. And also Ugaritic, and I have Ugaritic with a question mark because we're not really sure whether that's in a Northwest uh, Semitic language or not. Some people would put it into the Eastern group. And finally, we have the Eastern group of Semitic languages. Uh, they're called collectively Akkadian, uh, but usually we divide them between uh, the languages of Assyrian and of Babylonian. The reason that Akkadian is called Akkadian is because of this guy. I mean, what actually might not be him, it might be his grandson. But that's of the bust or that's a mask of a, uh, of a, uh, a feared Akkadian leader. And many people think that it's a uh, bust of Sargon of Akkad. If you look at the, uh, the map over to the right. And you'll see that uh, Sumer is to the south and what we call the uh, Fertile Crescent, uh, Assyria is to the north. Uh, they, they put Akkad in the middle. Uh, uh, the, the fact is it might be in the middle, but we don't really know exactly where it was. Uh, but the Akkadians, uh, these invaders, uh, they came from the north and to the east around 2020 BCE, and they displaced uh, the Sumerians that were there before. Uh, the Sumerians were not a uh, Semitic language. Uh, Sumerian is an Indo-European language, but uh, the Akkadians, the Akkadians uh, brought a uh, Semitic language with them. And if you look at the well, the way that Sargon, his name is an Akkadian, we'll re recognize things uh, about it immediately as being Semitic. Uh, Sharu Kinu. Uh, Sharu is related to the Hebrew word Sar, which means. Uh, minister or king, and kinu is, uh, means correct, uh, as, as in nachon. And the, uh, so his name was legitimate king, uh, the true king. If that sounds defensive to you, well, it is kind of defensive. Uh, all of these great leaders, um, well, many great leaders like uh, Moses, and uh, they have they have a uh, they have a birth story that is uh, even though they're even though they were destined for greatness, they were born in obscurity, and uh, so there was uh, there were rumors that uh, Sargon that Sharu Kinu was actually not of the uh, royal line, but his family was the family of cupbearers. So when he became a great king, king of kings. Uh, he insisted on the, uh, the title of the legitimate king, and whether or not he was um, legitimate by birth, uh, by um, he he uh, he he spread the empire, this first great Semitic empire, from the Persian Gulf all the way around uh, Assyria to the Mediterranean Sea. So he certainly uh, he certainly uh, earned the uh, assumption of legitimacy. And so the Akkadian languages are these Semitic languages which are based in Mesopotamia. Uh, the language endured even though uh, particular dynasties and particular kingdoms did not. We break it up into periods. We have this periodization. Uh, old Akkadian is considered to be the earliest uh, strata, which is uh, the time of Sargon and beyond. Uh, then we divide the um, we divide the uh, we divide the uh, it, the area into north and south. In the north were the Assyrians, and in the south were the Babylonians. And at various times, one side would be more strong than the other. And at various times, one party would uh, be a great empire, and the other side would be obscure. 
But, uh, and we know this from the Bible, that at certain times uh, Assyria would be strong and uh, Tiglak Pileser would roar out of the north and give trouble. At other times it was the Babylonians that were the great enemy. The, what is remarkable about this, well, one, you can see that this Akkadian language lasted for a tremendously long time. Uh, that uh, 2,500 years, even though there were changes throughout and the, and the players changed, uh, that's, that's an incredible run. That's an incredible uh, duration. For the last 500 years, uh, you look, it says late Babylonian from 600 BC until 100 AD. Uh, there was no Babylonian empire to speak of. Of course, around the year 500, the Persians uh, take over all of the Middle East. But even though it was displaced as a uh, empire, and by that time, the language, as we'll see next week, had been displaced by Aramaic, it continued for 500 years as a religious language that the scribes would keep up, the uh, people would continue to write documents into it until finally about the year 100, it ceases to be uh, spoken at all. And uh, when it ceases to be spoken at all, people just forgot how to read it. Uh, from the time of 100 AD until the eight, until the 19th century, we had no idea how to how to read uh, Akkadian, how to read the Babylonian language. Uh, the decipherment, the decipherment, as I said, waited for the 19th century, and this is an inscription that's uh, found in Persia called the uh, Buhustun inscription. And uh, this was erected by uh, Darius, uh, the king, that uh, I think the grandson or the cousin of Cyrus. But anyway, he, was a, he spread the empire, and he wanted to create a lasting monument to uh, tell the world what happened and uh, how, it, uh, how, it all, how it all went. So he built, he, he does this monument and out in um, a mountain, and he writes his annals. And he writes the annals in three different languages. All three of these uh, languages are written in cuneiform. I mean, the Persians famously have never had their own writing system. The first writing system that the Persians used was cuneiform. The second writing system was the uh, Aramaic, or we'd call it the Hebrew alphabet. And finally, they, um, finally today, they use the Arabic alphabet to write. But so one column is written in Old Persian, another column is written in Elamite, and the third column is written in Akkadian, in Babylonian. And this inscription functioned uh, sort of as a Rosetta Stone for, um, for the Akkadian language, just as with Egyptian, uh, we were able to decipher it because we had a um, because we had uh, several reference points to do because we were able to know the old Persian because well it's not that different than the new Persian and since we were able to figure out the proper names uh, we were able to identify the proper names on the Akkadian side and from there uh, just as with the Rosetta Stone it's a matter of um, solving the crossword puzzle and eventually they were able to decipher the language. And they had to test it after they had uh, deciphered it. So they, uh, they, they sent uh, uh, inscriptions independently to people with their uh, discovery to make sure that, they were, uh, that it could be verified, and it was. But with this discovery, we were eventually able to, um, we were able to, it opened up the world of uh, cuneiform and of Akkadian and ultimately Sumerian. So what is a cuneiform? A cuneiform is, well, this, uh, this writing that we're looking at here. It's designed to be uh, written on clay. A scribe makes a, a little wedge marks in the clay, and then uh, the thing is baked. Uh, cuneiform seems to have been developed by the uh, Sumerians as uh, sort of logograms. Uh, that's to say that it starts off as pictures of things, and then it goes on to become more um, stylized, more um, uh, just more more regular, more regular things. As I said before, Sumerian is an Indo-European language, 
Sargon brought the Akkadian language to Mesopotamia, but they kept the writing system that uh, the Sumerians had developed. Uh, even, even more than that, for hundreds of years after the fall of Sumer, the Sumerian language itself was preserved. Uh, Akkadian was, in a way, the Latin to, Sumerians, to, to, to Sumer, Sumerian Greek. That's to say that even though, uh, even though Sargon and the Assyrians and the Babylonians that followed him, even though they had by far the superior army, uh, they recognized that the real cradle of civilization had preceded them. And to be literate and to be cultivated was to know uh, the Sumerian language and to understand Sumerian writing and to know Sumerian literature. And so they, not only did they preserve the literature and the, uh, and, and the history, but they preserved the language itself for hundreds of years after the displacement of the Sumerian civilization. And even after the language itself died out, much of the literature and poetry was preserved in Akkadian. It became the Akkadian classical literature. So this is one of the great borrowings of, uh, of history. Not only, did they take the, not only did they take the writing system, but they made uh, the Akkadians, uh, the Semites who invaded, made a fundamental change in how the writing system was used. Uh, first off, to the, um, uh, to the left, you see a sign that has the evolution of what we call the on sign which in uh, Sumerian was either a um, determinative, a dingar, for God, or it was a um, word for heaven. And if you look at the earliest uh, representations of it, it's clear that this is drawing as best as you can with a wedged instrument, a star. And that what happens with evolution is that this um, logographic, this pictorial representation becomes something that's more stylized, it becomes something that's more regular until you get to the point of uh, New Babylonian where it's a, it's a very regular thing. You have two cross wedges and one down wedge. It, besides making the writing system more regular, uh, the Akkadians uh, made a, um, a, a real development in how writing systems were used. So not only could Akkadian use this sign to represent uh, the determinative god, Elu, uh, which is very close to the Hebrew word El for God, but they used the sign to represent the phonetic value An. Uh, now, An was a Sumerian for heaven, but when, Akkad but when the Semites wrote it, when the Akkadians wrote it, uh, they didn't uh, ha write it with the meaning of heaven. They wrote it as part of a uh, phonetic um, alphabet, as well as a syllabet. As um, so, the the uh, the development of um, the development of the writing system was not just to make it more regular, but the uh, but the uh, but the uh, Semites, the Akkadians, took something that was mostly uh, logographic, and they made it something that was uh, phonetic. And this was a great development. This was a great step in the history of writing systems. And you can see here, uh, this is a a typical sign list that one has to learn when one begins to study Akkadian. And uh, you can see that uh, there are, um, you see the signs. Originally, apparently, they represented uh, pictures or something, or something that uh, was visual. But uh, under the hands of the Akkadian, the Akkadians, they began, they became to recognize something, they began to represent something phonetic, something that um, would, we would just call, um, no, oh, it's not an alphabet because it's syllables, but uh, it's the same sort of thing. Only there are many, many more signs. And uh, the uh, uh, these signs have been classified for a long time. We put them in sign lists. We usually have a, um, uh, we'll, we'll try to arrange them in, uh, well, not alphabetical order, but in 
in some sort of logical order. Like we'll put all of the ones that had that start with a wedge down to first, and then all of the ones with a wedge down and one wedge across, and so on and so on, until you uh, until you get um, until you can classify all of them. Uh, you can see here that even with the development of the um, you, the development of something that represents syllables rather than signs, and that there is still a great deal of decipherment to go on in in normalizing an Akkadian text. Uh, because there, many of these are multivalent, they could represent many different syllables. Some of them maintained their logographic meaning even into Akkadian. Also, uh, the Akkadians had more consonants than the Sumerians did. And so we are always trying to um, parse apart the plosives and uh, uh, the pharyngeals. And there's a great deal of ambiguity in, uh, in the sign system. But uh, with, uh, with work, uh, one can uh, apply the sign list and one's knowledge of the language. And uh, this, is a, um, uh, this is a drawing of the inscription of Hammurabi's laws. And uh, with the sign list, it's an exercise to go through, uh, determine the syllables that each sign represents, and then you normalize it and you can uh, read it as though you were reading Hebrew, as though you were reading any other Semitic language. When Akkadian was deciphered, we had a real wealth of um, a real wealth of literature that informed the very way we look at scriptures. Uh, there are many parallels to the biblical literature, stories that had been handed down from the uh, Sumerians to the Akkadians and were preserved in this uh, language we had just uh, learned. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, we have the uh, story of creation and the flood story, but we have cognates to those in the Amuna Elish and in the 12th tablet of Gilgamesh. In uh, the uh, Hebrew Bible, we have a, a section of laws, uh, which we had always called the uh, Book of the Covenant, uh, the chapters which follow the Ten Commandments and which um, the chapters which follow the Ten Commandments and uh, have uh, their own sort of literary independence, uh, those are paralleled in many ways by laws that we find in the Code of Hammurabi, a, uh, a early Babylonian text. Or we could, um, we have uh, the, uh, of course, Sennacherib's Siege of Jerusalem in the Book of Kings, but now with Akkadian literature, we can read the other side. We can read uh, Sennacherib's Siege of Jerusalem from the other point of view, from the annals of Sennacherib. The, the impact on Bible studies has just been so enormous, it's impossible to... Um, it's impossible to characterize. Uh, you can, part of it is very challenging. I, I don't think before the laws of Hammurabi were discovered that most people would think of the Book of the Covenant as being anything other than a special divine legislation given to the children of Israel by Moshe Rabbeinu. But once we have the laws of Hammurabi and we see the parallels, uh, we see that uh, that this part of the Bible reflects the larger Near Eastern substrate that the children of Israel lived in. The way that we understand the flood story and the story of creation is um, affected very much by uh, the by what we've learned in the Muna Elish and in the twelfth tablet of Gilgamesh. It's very, um, many people would say that the true meaning, uh, that the true uh, Peshat, the true literary meaning of these stories, the story of creation and the flood story, uh, could not be known without the sources, that the true importance of it is to use these stories as a background and that the real message is the difference. That is to say the Hebrew Bible appears in a world where everybody knows 
of these Akkadian materials. And it's only by knowing these materials that uh, one can um, appreciate the um, that one can appreciate the revolutionary nature of it. I mean, for instance, the uh, the medium itself is of importance. Uh, that uh, the Akkadian materials, that the surrounding materials to the Hebrew Bible, are in poetry, uh, which is the language of myth, which is the form of myth. Uh, the Hebrew narrative is in prose, which is the form of history. And that no small amount of the, um, of the mission of the Jewish Bible is to take apart myth and to reduce it to, reduce it to history, to make, it, uh, make it more reasonable. The story of the flood in the 12th tablet of Gilgamesh, the um, flood comes about as the caprice and a battle between the gods and an argument that they are having. In the, uh, in the uh, story of the flood in the Bible, it's because of man's sin, and it's because, of a, um, it's because of a God acting in history. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's presented as a completely historical um, event. I mean, you can't, um, the, it has dates. The story of Noah that's in the Bible has dates. And that's, that's uh, you can't be a myth if you have dates. You know, a lot of people, um, a lot of people will say when they want to defend the Bible, when they want to see, when they see that the first chapter of the Bible can't be reconciled with the science that we have today, they'll say that, well, the Bible was never intended to be a book of science. Uh, that's a very problematic thing to say when you have this comparison in mind that in the Babylonian creation story, where all of the creation is accounted for by the heavenly drama, by the birth and battle and arguments of deities. And the Hebrew scripture is saying, no, no, that's not how creation works. God turns on creation and then creation runs itself. It's a much more scientific, a much more, a much less mythological presentation in the Hebrew Bible. And that's simply, um, so when you see the difference, the statement like the Bible was never intended to be a book of science, that becomes very problematic. The Bible in many ways wants to point us away from myth and, tor and towards science and towards history away from a um, God and goddess-dominated narrative of reality towards a human-dominated narrative of reality. But you, um, you can only see this when you have the Akkadian materials in the background. You can only see this when you have uh, that comparison. And so the uh, discovery and the decipherment of these materials uh, made for a very uh, for a, a revolution in the understanding of the Hebrew Bible. I many people in all flavors of Judaism will say that whatever we understand the rabbinic understanding of these stories to be, whatever we understand the Kabbalistic meaning of these stories to be, the literary meaning of these stories flows from the comparison that we make between between the uh, Hebrew Bible and this outside literature. And that's a, and, and that's a revolution, that's a revolution. Uh, going, going, from the, um, going from the quite um, grand to the quite uh, small, I just want to um, conclude with one example of how, uh, of how the, um, decipherment and the study of these languages has caused us to expand, to reevaluate our, our knowledge of our own history. That because of the imperial successes of the Babylonians and the Assyrians, uh, Akkadian became uh, the, um, the French language, the lingua franca of the Middle East. It was used as an administrative language uh, all the way to uh, Egypt. And in the 14th century in Egypt, 
And this is just by the way of how these things were preserved. I mean, there arose, I think it's very famous, uh, the heretic king Echnachton, who revolted against Egyptian polytheism and who moved the capital up the river <laughs> to Thebes, who built his own temple to the sun god Atan. The, uh, carving, the carving on the right is a vision of him and the sun god uh, connecting. He's saying hello. And uh, because this only lasted for one generation, after he died, uh, they all went back to being polytheist, and they abandoned this uh, city, Amarna, uh, that uh, much of the correspondence uh, that he conducted with um, everyone was preserved in this archaeological find. And much of the uh, many letters were found between Echnachton and his ministers and the petty kings of Canaan. In, uh, and the, uh, because Akkadian was the lingua franca of the Middle East, even though Echnachton didn't speak uh, Akkadian around the house, and even though they didn't speak Akkadian around the house in Canaan, for purposes of correspondence, they used Akkadian to write back and forth. They would say, uh, things are great, send us more money. Uh, things are not so great, you have to lower our taxes. Because this wasn't a native language to them, because they were using it just for administrative purposes, uh, they spoke it rather poorly. <laughs> they, didn't, uh, they spoke it with a heavy Canaanite accent. And so evaluating the Canaanite glosses in there, the uh, parts of it where they lapse into uh, Canaanite, or evaluating the parts where they just misuse, uh, from our point of view, Akkadian, and if they misuse it in a consistent way, they can, they can give us evidence as to how they really were um, wanted to speak. Uh, this is one of our great uh, one of our great sources of, of information about what proto Hebrew looked like. That uh, we when we turn to the Northwest family, and we look at uh, the emergence of Hebrew, we really start to see it um, e emerge as an archaeological and as a um, independent language. Uh, a few about this time and in the next few hundred years, we see Hebrew emerging. And so this is some of the earliest evidence we have of how that, uh, of what that language was like. And we used these tablets very heavily to reconstruct the grammatical and the syntactic and the phonological history of the language. And uh, so beyond the category of this is very cool, uh, this is an example of how um, you know, I said I said at the outset that this uh, Hebrew is a bit player in this, but we'll see throughout this that Hebrew pops up in different um, in different ways. Uh, just one more uh, slide to um, point out: this is one of the coolest times to be alive as a Semitic scholar, or just as a person who's interested in this. This is a page of the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary which was um, begun shortly after World War II. And I think they planned to finish it in 10 years or so, or, or 20 years. Uh, it took 10 years just to do the first volume. And the dictionary was finally finished in 2011. And this is, um, it has um, all of the words, everything you could want in it. And uh, get this, it's online for free. <laughs> You can just uh, go get a PDF of it and read. So this is an um, example of why this is a great time to, um, to be alive. I can, um, I can remember when I was taking Acadian at Penn in the 1990s at the uh, Semitic Studies room, there was, uh, there was a big table in the middle, and stacked on this table were two were two uh, sets of the uh, Chicago Assyrian Dictionary as it had existed at that time. They were still missing a few volumes and people would always, um, so you'd see people uh, shuffling over to the table to grab a volume and take it back to where they were. They'd be back in a few minutes for another volume. Now you can do it all by your computer 
and you don't even have to put out any money for it. So it's um, there. There are nice things about being uh, alive today. That's the. Um, that's really the uh, lecture of um, Acadian. And there's a little bit of a, there's about a 20 second lag I can detect between me talking and uh, what's going on on the monitor. So I see that there are a couple people watching. Uh, no one's checked in on the comments. Uh, if you, uh, so if you want to make a comment or ask a question, I'll stay on for about a minute. Okay, so I will um, hopefully get your feedback from off the air, and I will um, we'll, uh, see uh, how we can make this experience uh, everything that it should be. I hope everyone has a good night.